This is the second part of a film that looks at how the ideas of continental drift proposed by Alfred Wegener were trashed in the 1920s. The Earth's Physical Geography, Continents and Oceans. 100 years ago, a radical idea was proposed that over millions of years, continents moved. That now separate fossil communities were once able to mix. Continental drift, proposed by German Earth scientist Alfred Wegener. A mobile Earth, an idea that was supported by alpine geologists like Emil Argand, who saw mountain ranges as the products of huge tectonic displacements. This is mobilism. But a counter-idea was that continents remain stationary on the Earth's surface. Fixism. But that animals, from time to time, could move between continents along temporary land bridges, which would then sink beneath the waves. So we have two sides. Fixists, ocean basins, have been there since time immemorial. Nothing to see here, folks. No tectonics apart from little bits on the edges of continents. And on the other, we have advocates for large-scale continental drift, classically Wegener, but supported by the work of Argon and other alpine geologists who are happy with the idea of large-scale horizontal displacements, and it's those that form mountain belts. Things came to a head between fixists and mobilists in the mid-1920s. There are certain events in history that have passed into folklore. Julius Caesar's assassination on the Ides of March in Rome, or the Sex Pistols gig at the Lesser Free Trade Hall in Manchester, or the special symposium called at the American Association of Petroleum Geologists in New York in 1926. Convened by Willem van Wotterschut van de Graaff, a geologist in the Netherlands, he called on North American geologists to a discussion of continental drift. It was the publication of the English translation of Wegener's third edition that really kick-started this storm in North America. And you'll find many accounts of the debates in various histories of science, in papers, and in uh, numerous books uh, by participants in the plate tectonic revolution that followed decades later, and by famous historians of science. But in this film, I want to look at the conduct of the debate, the language used, and the fallout that impacted on North American science in the following decades. And I'll draw some broader lessons that remain relevant today. So let's go back to the 1920s. And I want to move beyond the mythical status of the symposium in New York and look at the publications that resulted from it. Van der Rauw put together a volume of papers. Actually, very few of them were presented at the symposium itself. But he received contributions from the great and the good of American geoscience. Bailey Willis, president of the Seismological Society and at the time GSA president. Charles Berkey, future GSA president. Andrew Lawson, GSA president a couple of years previously at the time of the symposium. Chester Longwell, who would become GSA president in 1949. But at the time, he was a colleague of Charles Suchet. Suchet, the first president of the Paleontology Society of America and a former GSA president. And then there was Edward Wilbur Berry, an influential geologist at USGS and Harvard, and Rollin Chamberlain, T.C. Chamberlain's son. But there were others who contributed papers as well, including the Dutch earth scientist Gustav Mollengraf, who wrote these prescient words, arguing that the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, along which the American and European African continents split apart, likening it to the Rift Valley of Africa. A young Chester Longwell sought common ground, wanted to look carefully at the evidence and test the idea of a mobile Earth against it. 
Others, however, were less balanced. Bailey Willis wrote this, arguing that Wegener was not an impartial investigator. Suchet was even blunter, suggesting that the quality of Wegener's science was lacking and that he generalises from the generalisations of others, which of course anybody reviewing information will be doing. But then he goes on to summon up the ghost of James Dana and argue for American exceptionalism, arguing that Dana's enlightenment had yet to reach Europe and that they continued to believe in a mobile earth when it was self-evidently true that the continents were fixed. Ronin Chamberlain pulled no punches, suggesting that Wagner's approach was slapdash, that correlations weren't appropriate, and even the way that Wagner conducted science was not robust. Can we call geology a science when there exists such difference of opinion on fundamental matters as to make it possible for such a theory as this to run wild? Ronin concludes, if we are to believe Wegener's hypothesis, we must forget everything which has been learned in the last 70 years and start all over again. Indeed. But historians of science have looked beyond the papers, such as the correspondence between Suchet and Mollengraf, to admit that North America and South America have drifted to the West by up to 5,000 miles can only be acceptable to forgetful or deranged minds. In the years that followed the Continental Drift Symposium and the publication of those papers, Bailey Willis and Charles Suchet actively promoted their idea of land bridges and Isthmian links, but with fixed continents, against the idea of continental drift. And they published two papers back to back in an edition of the Geological Society of America, even circulating bound versions of their off-prints as a single booklet. Their aims are clear from correspondence between Willis and Suchet. I hope the geologists of the world will agree to a man. Of course, there were very, very few female geologists at the time. To accept our views as to how the transoceanic bridges may be made and unmade, not the unreasonable ones asked for by biogeographers, i.e. the mobilists, crossing all parts of the oceans, but the reasonable ones asked for by paleontologists. Ha ha ha, we live or die together, nicht wahr? Is that not true? The sarcastic German at the end is surely not coincidental. Well, this has been a famous, or actually rather infamous, debate in science. Many accounts of it stress the problem being that the Americans rejected continental drift because of the lack of a viable driving mechanism. Although it has to be said, there were very few viable driving mechanisms for any type of tectonics, at least in the early part of the 20th century. Now, the problem with the debate was the way in which it was conducted, the language with which the American side, or at least some of them, ridiculed the proponents of continental drift. That hostility clearly was designed to dissuade anybody for taking up the arguments of continental drift. And in a time where science was governed by patronage, the effect of that was to turn off a whole generation, maybe several generations, of scientists, particularly American scientists, from the idea of a mobile Earth. Frank Bursley Taylor's mobilist mountain building ideas were simply ignored, and there were broader impacts too. Now you can make a pretty strong argument that people who would otherwise go on to research into global tectonic problems were strongly dissuaded from doing so because of the attitude of Suchet and Willis towards new ideas. And indeed, others at the time went on to consider distinct geological problems. For example, in the late 1920s, under guidance from Rollin Chamberlain, Ted Link 
completed his PhD on analog models of defamation, but he moved back to the Canadian oil industry, building the foundations of foothill structural geology and Alberta's oil and gas industry. And through the 1920s and 30s, textbook writers perhaps considered continental drift and even punctuated diastrophism as perhaps too controversial to be included in their works. In a review of Marlon Billing's classic work, one reviewer bemoaned this omission. Mind you, that reviewer was Roland Chamberlain. As an aside, Billings is a controversial figure in his own right in some circles of American academe for closing Harvard's human geography department, leading to other closures across the US. But that's the story perhaps for another day. Away from North America, two people did keep the flame alive for continental drift and mobile tectonics. Most notably, Alex Dutois in South Africa and Arthur Holmes in Britain. Both established important books and ideas developing and modifying Wegener's continental drift ideas. As for Wegener himself, he went on to publish a fourth edition of his classic book, but he himself played no further part in the story. In 1930, he went on his fourth expedition to Greenland, but died on the ice. He was 50 years old. With Wegener's demise, mobilism all but vanished, certainly for North America. Dana's notion of the perfect continent fixed in its place on Earth, tectonic processes restricted to its margins, developed into the punctuated diastrophism of T.C. Chamberlain and leading inexorably to Suchert and Willis's land bridges and Isthmian links. And this fixedist paradigm became the only acceptable global geological model, led by Suchert and Willis, reinforced by Roland Chamberlain's vitriol. No other model was possible. All contrary empirical data disregarded or rubbished. This is an illustration of how precious theory, passionately held, has trumped empiricism. Now, the American fixists should have been well aware of the dangers of this. A prominent philosopher of science who compared the dangers of being too wedded to a single hypothesis, perhaps like fixism, likening it to an unconditional love a parent has for a child. The moment one has offered an original explanation for a phenomenon which seems satisfactory, that moment affection for his intellectual child springs into existence. And as the explanation grows into a definite theory, his parental affections cluster around him, so that while he holds it seemingly tentative, it is still lovingly tentative and not impartially tentative. So soon as this parental affection takes possession of the mind, there is a rapid passage to the adoption of the theory. Instinctively, there is a special searching out of phenomena that support it, for the mind is led by its desires. That quote comes from T.C. Chamberlain, Rollins' father. One of the arch fixists, but also the advocate of multiple working hypotheses. <laughs> it's a bit of a shame he didn't practice what he preached. As the late Robert Newman wrote about Willis, Suchert and Chamberlain, they were guilty of single model syndrome, namely tectonic fixism. And their culpability is greater because they preached open-mindedness and multiple working hypotheses. Newman explores their fixed ideas in this very readable account. But fixism didn't stop there, nor was intransigence restricted to North American Earth scientists. As president of the Geological Society of London in the 1950s, George Lees advocated the shrinking earth model of T.C. Chamberlain, continuing to rubbish Wegener and Dutois' evidence for continental drift. The supposed fit of the two sides of the Atlantic can only be achieved by bending and manipulating the continents 
to such a degree that the whole conception loses validity, unless a jigsaw puzzle type of manoeuvre is allowed as a scientific method. Those words were published just a decade before Teddy Bullard made his classic retrofit of circumatlantic continents, by which stage the plate tectonic revolution was in full swing, driven by knowledge from the world's oceans, which in turn provided robust explanations for continental phenomena like mountain ranges. Of course, it's easy to mock the ideas of early geologists from the start of the 20th century, late 19th century. And indeed, how do you think scientists in a hundred years' time will view our ideas? But that's not really the point of this video. We've seen how, in the 1920s, a group of highly influential geologists essentially closed down any consideration of a tectonically mobile Earth. What Newman called American intransigence. And some of those behaviours have echoes today. Consider T.C. Chamberlain's warning about being too wedded to a single hypothesis. What he's describing here is a tendency towards confirmation bias, special searching out of phenomena that support a single hypothesis. Working with other scientists should help to break this bias. But if all those scientists simply accept a single model and don't accept dissenting views, reinforced in a system of patronage, such as the uncritical acceptance of T.C. Chamberlain's punctuated diastrophism, you run into groupthink, defined by Janice, who coined the term, as a psychological drive for consensus at any cost that suppresses dissent and appraisal of alternatives in coherent decision-making groups. Janice coined the term when looking at the causes of disastrous American foreign policy decisions in the late 1960s and the start of 1970s. But others since have explored groupthink as a factor in failed risk assessments, for example, in mountaineering expedition accidents, the Fukushima energy plant disaster, and even the Deepwater Horizon Macondo well blowout, fire and oil spill. The rejection of continental drift is a prime example and it was reinforced by how protagonists viewed their dissenters. Suchet assumed that his American community was superior to European earth scientists, an example of what is now called othering. Of course, I'm aware in constructing this great scientific argument as a conflict between mobilists and fixists, I'm on the path to othering. In other words, creating polar opposites and forcing a choice between them. Willis and Suchet, two of the most influential geologists in North America in the 1920s and 30s. Their behaviour formed a silo, what we might now call an echo chamber. Yet the global community was broad and diverse, not just Wegener and Taylor, but also Mollengraf, Dutois, Holmes and others. Collectively, they had much of the puzzle. If we want multiple hypotheses to test against evidence, then diversity matters. T.C. Chamberlain's writings essentially make this point. Individuals are prone to confirmation bias. Challenged by other scientists can break this. But this requires that different communities respect each other, that debates are rooted in testing hypotheses, especially one's own, against facts, and certainly not by devaluing the ideas of others by considering one's own community to be exceptional. The debates around continental drift are a lesson from history. Now, geology, like all science, is about competing ideas and hypotheses, and we should allow these to flourish and then challenge them with facts and reason debate. What we've seen here is how that debate is closed off if we allow prejudice and vitriol to get in the way.